What if I told you that there was a magical formula for making everyone in a society happier, making us live longer and healthier, making us have stronger relationships that are more emotionally fulfilled, providing a safer and healthier environment for our children, and having a more economically prosperous, stable, and safer society at large? Well, such a formula exists, and it's called marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. Historically speaking, there are two main options for sexual behavior in society, monogamy or polygamy. Monogamy is the practice of being married to one person at a time. The definition of marriage is the covenant or promise that unites men and women to one another and to any children that may come from their union. Polygamy means the marriage of one person to multiple spouses. Polygamy historically almost always means polygyny, which means one man will have multiple wives. And polygyny is geared more towards the male having separate wives, and that's what we're striving to do. One woman with multiple husbands, polyandry, barely exists throughout history. For example, 83% of indigenous societies were polygynous, with only 1% being polyandrous. But what if society tried polyamory, meaning that everyone just had multiple sexual partners, all bets off without commitments? Well, a curious thing happens. The society still becomes basically polygynous, meaning a few men will have multiple female sexual partners. This is due to the inherent differences in our reproductive abilities and the dominant sexual preferences of men and women. For example, a man can get many women pregnant in a short amount of time, whereas a pregnancy will occupy a woman for nine months and then however long she is the caregiver of the newborn. Also, generally speaking, in some ways, non-committed sex tends to be easier for men than for women. Most women tend to initially place more boundaries around their desires for sex. Furthermore, if we're just considering first look physical attractiveness, while men view many women as above threshold in attractiveness, women tend to be only initially physically attracted to the men in the top 20th percentile. This can be a major problem for regular looking guys in the dating app world. Loser. 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 A group of elite men develops who are attractive, wealthy, considered high status, and they may start sleeping with the most available interested women. And so free love societies always turn into polygynous societies, a few powerful men surrounded by many women. This is why throughout history, societies largely fit into one of two molds, one man and one woman, or one man and multiple women. Though many societies used to be polygamous, the vast majority of societies today are monogamous. And this has been true for at least the last few millennia. Only 2% of the global population today lives in polygamous households. In short, monogamy took over the world. So here's the question, why is monogamy so prevalent today? Well, we know from vast amounts of research that the model that brings the most stability to society and that brings maximum happiness to both men and women is monogamy. One man and one woman committed in marriage for life. And to be clear, a man and a woman who want to get married must be free to marry, they must consent to the marriage, and they should be faithful to one another and committed to any children that they produce together. And the marriage must be attested to publicly by witnesses. These are the qualifications for a legitimate marriage, free, consensual, faithful, fruitful, and of course, public. So let's break this down and look at the data on the many, many benefits that monogamy provides over polygamy. It is important to note that the majority of these benefits do not apply to couples who are monogamously cohabitating without getting married. A polygamous society leaves a majority of men without mates, and they can become an unstable and violent element of society. Why won't you talk to me? Why don't you answer my calls when I call? You think I don't know you're here? Notice that as marriage has declined, we've seen the rise of the incel, involuntary celibate community, as well as the increased incidence of the mass shooter, the vast majority of which are lonely young males. As we know now, tragically, it's a norm. Every other person is like Travis Bickle now. 
Marriage reduces the likelihood of men being violent and committing crime, reducing a man's overall criminal likelihood by 35%. Women and children are less protected and provided for in a polygamous society because they are sharing a father and a husband. Children are better taken care of in a monogamous society, beginning with the fact that they are not killed in the first place. 87% of children who are aborted are conceived by parents who are unmarried, and that includes cohabitating couples. Marriage creates lower domestic violence rates against women and children. Children living in cohabitating households are more likely to suffer from a variety of emotional and social problems, including drug use, depression, and dropping out of high school, as compared to those in married homes. Except for the few powerful men, the men and women of a polygamous society are having less and worse sex and worse emotional bonds. Monogamous societies in which men and women are paired one-on-one -on -one have the strongest emotional connections and the most sex, because monogamy provides the environment for greater commitment, intimacy, and practice. Notice that in our own society today, as we become less monogamous and marriage rates go down, people are having less sex and less satisfying sex. A 2013 review of nearly 200 studies that measured sexual satisfaction in over 40 ways consistently found that people in deep, intimate relationships that were supportive and communicative had much higher rates of sexual satisfaction. They also found that the more sexual partners a person had, the less likely they were to be satisfied with sex. These findings were echoed in other studies as well. Deep levels of intimacy were the greatest predictors of specifically female satisfaction. Marriage also gives women a higher status than polygamy. A woman who has to compete with other women in a marriage has less say in her own marriage. You have the nerve, the colossal nerve, to say you don't want to share, Bill. Well, I've got news for you. It wasn't news. You've never been good at sharing. And a woman who is a commodity to be collected and controlled, as polygamy nearly always demands, has no standing at all. One study concludes, Historically, we know that universal monogamous marriage preceded the emergence of democratic institutions in Europe and the rise of the notions of equality between the sexes. This is why the sexual revolution's promise that breaking down monogamy in society would lead to more and better sex for everyone and more freedom for women is a complete lie. I mean, look at this picture of sexual revolutionary Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy. Does something look off to you? What about this guy or this guy? Married couples are four times wealthier than couples that merely live together or cohabitate. Married men earn 10 to 40% more than single guys. Not only that, but the average 50-something married man accumulates three times as many assets as his unmarried peers. There are also far fewer STIs, sexually transmitted infections, among those who are married. Married people live longer. In particular, men who stay married live about 10 years longer than unmarried men. Marriage is clearly superior to polygamy or to cohabitation. So why aren't more people getting married? Sadly, marriage rates have fallen dramatically. The US marriage rate has dropped nearly 60% over the last 50 years. Seems like monogamy is an outdated idea. Why is this? Why is an institution that is clearly so good for society and so good for individuals being avoided by so many people. Let's look at the obstacles to a healthy monogamous society. We're not gonna cover them all here. We're just going to mention six major obstacles. The first major obstacles to monogamy in society are contraception and abortion. These create a cultural mindset in which sex becomes separate from children and sex becomes separate from commitment. The idea that we should get married before having sex because we might become pregnant or bond with each other lifelong, or we're already pregnant, so we better get married, went out the window. I understand it's the 21st century and you've probably had premarital relations with my daughter. And now most people don't even think that you need to get married, even if you plan on raising a child. In 2006, about half of US adults said it was very important for couples having children together to legally marry. By 2020, that proportion had fallen to 29%. Today, the proportion of US births to unmarried mothers is about 40%, double the percentage in 1980. The United States has the highest share of single parenting in the world at 23%, which is nearly one in four children. This is over three times the worldwide average. And most single parent homes, about 80%, are led by single mothers 
because abortion culture especially has separated children from the responsibility of fathers. Think about it. When a culture is told that abortion is just a woman's issue, it's just a woman's right, and that it's a decision between a woman and her doctor, the clear subtext is that the child is not the man's responsibility. It's her body and it's her choice. So don't be asking me for anything. The function of that language is to give the man license to abandon a pregnant woman. They use the language of women's freedom, but what really is she free to do? Either kill her child or be a single mother who may or may not receive child support payments. I was like, look, this, it's, it's, it's up to you. You know, like it's your choice. You can either, you can either have the abortion or like you can raise the kid on your own, but like you're, like wow. you're free. In reality, abortion is not women's empowerment, but a woman's abandonment and a child's murder. Abortion and the breakdown of the family are in a vicious cycle. Abortion leads to the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of the family leads to abortion. Some may propose contraception as a solution to pregnancies out of wedlock, but contraception simply incentivizes sexual encounters between people who are not committed to one another and to any children that they may conceive. Birth control made it possible for both men and women to experience this false sense of security about unmarried sex, that if they simply used protection and practiced safe sex, they wouldn't experience any repercussions. Drive carefully, and don't forget to fasten your condom. Dad! Seatbelt, I meant, I meant seatbelt. But the reality is, contraception fails. In fact, half of women who aborted reported using a contraceptive method in the month that they became pregnant. Two, sex before marriage. Did you know that the greatest predictor of extramarital sex affairs is premarital sex? The data shows that when you have premarital sex, you are more likely to cheat on your future partners and your future spouse. This, of course, does not have to be anyone's fate, but it's a statistical reality. Premarital sex leads to greater instances of divorce. Additionally, for both men and women, sex before the age of 18 was correlated with a greater number of occurrences of divorce within the first 10 years of marriage. Three, divorce. Widely accepted divorce is also an obvious obstacle to a healthy monogamous society. The divorce rate can be a hard thing to measure, but it hit a peak of about 41% for people who married 40 years ago. The divorce rate seems to have been falling ever since, but this may be because more couples are choosing to cohabitate rather than marry in the first place. Children of divorce are less likely to marry when they become adults. Daughters of divorced parents have a 60% higher rate of divorce when they do become adults, and sons have a 35% higher rate. In addition, when one couple divorces, it is more likely for their close friends and family to consider divorce. Couples who have friends who divorce have a 75% increase in their risk of their own marriage ending. Even couples with two degrees of separation from divorce still have a 33% greater risk. Because of this link, some sociologists considered divorce to be a social contagion. Divorce is also devastating to both adults and children. Children of divorced parents are more likely to be sick, more likely to experience mental health issues, more likely to exhibit antisocial behavior, these children are also more likely to be abused, to be incarcerated, and to suffer from drug and alcohol abuse. After divorce, between one-fifth and one-third of divorced women will fall into poverty. Men who are the least likely to divorce are also those who do their best to hold down a stable job, who don't abuse drugs or alcohol, who are sexually faithful, who attend religious services regularly with their wives, and who make a regular effort to be emotionally engaged in their marriage. Four, abuse. The people in history who have fought the most aggressively for the breakdown of monogamy and the breakdown of the family as an institution largely have one thing in common. They experienced abuse. They were abused by a family member, most often their father. And instead of blaming the abuser or looking to other factors that might have made their abuser an unhealthy person, these individuals often blamed marriage and the family. The worst things are the best things when they are abused. But we have to be able to distinguish between the best things like marriage and family and the abuse of those things. Otherwise, we will end up attacking the good thing rather than the abuse of it. Five, our cultural perception of marriage. Another major obstacle to monogamy is our often negative cultural perception of marriage. Marriage is like an unfunny, tense version of everybody loves Raymond, but it doesn't last 22 minutes. 
Last forever. Even though monogamy does much to protect and provide for women, marriage is largely portrayed in the media as a patriarchal institution that is all about male power and authority. I feel like I'm locking you into the patriarchy as I do this. Or it's portrayed as a ball and chain for men that limits their options, freedom, and endangers their financial security. I mean, what are you thinking about, Jerry? Marriage? Family? Well, they're yeah. prisons! <laughs> Man-made prisons! You're doing time! Marriage is also portrayed as a place where people's dreams go to die. People are told to delay marriage during their most fertile years, far into their 30s or even their 40s, because they are told that once they marry, their best days are over. A spouse and kids are presented as the obstacles, somehow, of the realization of one's personal ambitions. You didn't come to ask for my hand in marriage? You're a super smart, independent woman with an amazing future ahead of you. Why would you want to get married right now? And so we have to change the cultural perception of marriage through media and entertainment to recognize its inherent good to women and men over the alternatives. And we have to show people that a healthy marriage and a family is a dream come true. That is the dream. Six, the screen. The last major obstacle we'll mention to healthy monogamy today is the screen. The iPhone, the computer, the laptop, the iPad. This includes widespread pornography via the internet, but it also includes addictive social media use, video games, streaming movies, and television. We are replacing personal interaction with other human beings with our screens, and this wrecks havoc on the dating world and can wreak havoc on a marriage, crippling good communication and bonding. Pornography is especially pervasive and harmful to marriages because it introduces sexual infidelity into a relationship. We need to quit and stop excusing porn use. And we need to turn off our screens, go take a walk in nature, go look deeply into another human being's beautiful eyes. So what are the solutions? We have already mentioned some, but let's end with this. It is interesting to note that the motivations not to get married seem to set in at a particular time in people's lives. In 1976, 74% of high school seniors said they expected to get married. And in 2020, 71% said so. The number of high schoolers who expected to get married has largely stayed the same, but the marriage rate has fallen drastically. Right now, only 53% of adults, 25 to 54, are married. Only 53%. Whatever the obstacles to marriage are, they seem to be encountering people after high school. What young adults seem to need most right now is help with the transition from high school into life with a good income, marriage, and kids. For all we spend on education, and despite the 12 grades that we put virtually every child through, there is far too little guidance and direction for young people today for how to prepare for marriage and family, prepare to be financially responsible. It's insane that students learn calculus, but not how to do their taxes, how to date well, how to choose a spouse well, how to stay happily married, and how to parent well. We also have to recognize marriage for what it truly is, and recognize its inherent goodness. The future is family, and at the heart of healthy families is healthy marriage.